Um, yeah, so what I do is quite a bit different than everything else you've been hearing uh, so far. So the first thing I'll do, of course, is sort of introduce the, the group here. So uh, uh, Kathy Light, uh, believe it or not, uh, we're only related by marriage. So, uh, but in fact, she does most of the work. And so I'll attribute almost everything to her. Uh, and if she gets it right, I get it wrong almost every time. Uh, Dr. Cindy Bateman is our clinician extraordinaire. Uh, and that's true, and many of you know about her already, and she is just absolutely fantastic in terms of, we could not do any of this work if it hadn't been for her. Andrea White is our exercise scientist. She also helps us with a lot of other aspects. Marcus Aman, I'm, I'm gonna introduce you to him for those who don't know him. So he is actually uh, also an expert in fatigue, but he's, an interest, he's actually been interested in fatigue from the point of view of true fatigue, not chronic fatigue syndrome. So what the heck is fatigue at all, uh, at all period itself? Uh, and that one actually is uh, very important to really understand what's going on in chronic fatigue as well. And then Ron Hugan, who is our lab organizer, and without him, again, none of this would have happened. In addition to thing, things that, that none of it would happen, <laughs> uh, we, uh, I have to thank our Department of Anesthesiology, which, who has been very generous in actually helping us with funding a lot of our, our, the studies we've done. Uh, the University uh, of Utah School of Medicine also contributed uh, early on to uh, uh, our work, which was really brave on their part. I don't think they knew, I didn't know for sure, when we first started working on chronic fatigue syndrome, how, uh, how uh, uh, controversial it was, uh, uh, but they gave us a, a good pot of money to get this started, I'll, I'll, and Cindy was one of the people that benefited from this early on as well. Uh, and then, of course, Saul CFS, uh, the American Fibromyalgia Society, and then a, a whole, not a whole series, but a, a few very, very helpful uh, uh, patient donors who made uh, much of the research that we're doing possible. Okay, pain and fatigue. So first of all, I'll let you know a little bit about, for those who don't know about me, is that I'm a neuroscientist. Uh, I'm not a metabolomic met, 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 met scientist. I've been doing research on the basic mechanisms of pain for over 40 years. Did most of this at the University of North Carolina, moved to Utah in uh, 2013. Uh, and really, for 40 years, I've been wanting to actually uh, uh, work on fatigue. So 40 years ago, there was a debate about whether pain was actually a, a specific sensory system at all. Uh, and it, this is, it had many of the, the same problems that fatigue has today. Uh, essentially, our group, uh, led by uh, Ed Pearl, who died just la a couple years ago, uh, proved that it was both, that both it was a specific sensory system, there were specific neurons dedicated to, to uh, uh, evoking pain, uh, and also that there, it, it had emotional aspects to it, and, and all the pathways have been solved since then. Uh, and like fatigue today, pain was at that time considered to have no objective features, and uh, that we actually showed that, the showing that the fact that there were specific sensory pathways ended the arguments about whether, was this something that we could actually really work on? Could we do anything about it? Or was it something we, sh that we should just, uh, 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 give to the, the psychologist, not even the psychiatrist, because we had no treatments that would actually be helpful in terms of long-term uh, 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 pain. So uh, all of this eventually led to strong science that has finally, only in the last four years, believe it or not, uh, now we're coming up with uh, effective treatments for chronic pain, and it took that long. I'm really hoping it doesn't take that long for fatigue. So, okay. So. 11 years ago, uh, Dr. Uh, Edwin McCleskey actually determined the key that made, made it possible for me to actually understand what fatigue really was. And what he found was that the receptors for fatigue don't respond to a single signal, which is what we had thought for many years. Instead, they respond to a combination of signals. Uh, and those signals are exactly the same substances you make when you exercise, as it turned out. The things like lactate, well, yeah, that's there. Protons, meaning acid, that's there. Uh, and uh, also uh, ATP, of all things. ATP actually comes out of cells, as, as uh, was shown previously. Uh, <laughs> uh, and when you actually exercise, it doesn't stay inside. It actually comes out when you exercise. But all three of those need to be present simultaneously for you to actually feel the sensation of fatigue, okay? So that's the way, the way, the way it really works. 
So from that, we, and it's actually my wife again that decided we should do this. She, uh, we were using mouse models at that time, and she convinced me that, wait a minute, you know, mouse models aren't that great when you're, when you're talking about fatigue, because you can't ask the mouse, are you stopping your running because you're fatigued, or do you stop running because it's pain, right? So, and she's right, of course. Yeah, uh, but I said, we can't do this. And she said, yes, you can. And as I've said, she, she uh, violated the, the IRB and said, well, I'll be the first person to try this out. <laughs> so she was. So it turns out that, uh, that we eventually discovered that fatigue was, in fact, part of a complex system uh, that protects people from using up their energy stores. And this system uh, includes parts of the cardiovascular system, the autonomic nervous system, and the sensory receptors in, 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 that influence nearly all parts of your body. So fatigue, that's fatigue. It's not chronic fatigue. That's normal fatigue. That's what it's supposed to do. So she convinced me that we could use gene expression to actually look at this, this in humans, and she was the first one that actually we showed that gene expression really did work in terms of looking at fatigue itself. Okay. So again, the fatigue we are looking at is, is not MECFS. So, uh, and the fact that our gene expression uh, is from immune cells suggested that immune function might actually hold clues to the causes of uh, uh, MECFS and fibromyalgia. So when we actually use the gene expression in, uh, uh, in our MECFS patients, we found that in fact there was a very large difference in the gene expression in at least 60% of the patients who had chronic fatigue syndrome. We published two papers, two major papers on that, uh, the last one in, in uh, 2011. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the problem is, of course, there is another subgroup in that, <laughs> that in fact, instead of having increases in, in gene expression, they had great decreases in gene expression, which is part of the reason other people haven't actually been able to see this very effectively in, in their studies. You have to actually have the right, right patient population to actually see that. Right here, yeah. So um, the fact that the expression in the immune cells uh, uh, held us, it gave us an idea that there, there might be a clue that fatigue uh, is, there's something special about fatigue that, that, uh, uh, that in fact might be something a little different than we thought it was. Uh, and that clue was that fatigue is common in mitochondrial diseases. So, now I'm going to talk about autoimmunity, my, uh, mitochondria, and mutations in MECFS. And the question was how to put this all together. How do, how do those things combine? How to get autoimmunity and mitochondria mutations? How does that have, what, what's in common here? Uh, well, there's been a couple of recent publications that indicated that autoimmune disease might cause chronic, uh, 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 chronic fatigue syndrome in at least a subgroup of the patients. Two of these papers suggested it might be treatable with drugs that alter autoimmune response. And so we, and one of them was Janusz. <laughs> Janusz, okay, I get it wrong. Uh, uh, so I knew I was gonna get it wrong, sorry about that. <laughs> correct me. No, he's not gonna correct me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Dr. Berquist, there we go. That's the, that's the way to do it, okay. So uh, at any rate, we collaborated with Dr. Madeline Cunningham at the, at, at the uh, uh, University of Oklahoma uh, we gave her blindly samples, and she uh, gave us the fi the fi some findings on what really happened in some patients. Okay. This pilot study, uh, altogether we had, uh, we found that, and this is what she found, basically, it, she sent the data back to us, that 15 of 18 uh, patients who, uh, uh, who had chronic fatigue syndrome had positive autoimmune findings to the beta adrenergic receptors or muscarinic receptors. And that's exactly what uh, Dr. Berkvist also uh, uh, showed, uh, and that which was fairly, when we saw it, I hadn't seen it until just this week, <laughs> those results, but that was very comforting when we saw that. These receptors normally control the flow of, bl of blood in muscles and brain. So that's one thing that to know, of course, that it would, it would obviously cause many of the symptoms that the patients here have uh, if, in fact, you had those autoantibodies. Well, these autoantibodies could cause the symptoms seen in these patients. The question is, why did these patients make these autoantibodies at all, right? So why should they make these? Well, this is sort of the, the, our current hypothesis and, and a, a very 
popular hypothesis, and that's a thing called molecular mimicry. So the molecules are mimicking something. Uh, normally, the immune system fights off diseases like the flu, mononucleosis, strep, and those sorts of things by making antibodies that specifically target certain proteins in these pathogens. However, these targets often, maybe always, <laughs> are similar to proteins in, in patients that are found in the fatigue system. Remember, I told you, it's a complex system with lots of vulnerabilities. So if you target any, if any portion of that, you could get the, the phenomena that you, you, the patients experience. So this may be why these diseases also cause fatigue as one of their symptoms. So the fact that, in fact, they are attacking the fatigue system. So normally, after viruses or bacteria are eliminated by these, auto, these antibodies, in this case not autoantibodies, uh, they, uh, once they are quit, we get rid of those, normally the immune cells quit making the antibodies and the fatigue should go away. That's the normal thing that happens. Whenever you get sick, everybody gets fatigued. But then when you get better, it goes away. I think there good explanations also came to, for that same phenomena uh, uh, from a talk earlier today. However, in some people, the immune cells don't quit. They keep making autoantibodies against the fatigue system. When these people then get re-exposed to whatever the antigen was in, in these uh, 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 pathogens, they get even more fatigue. So why don't immune cells quit in these people? That's the big question. So we hypothesize that this may be because they have a mutation in some uh, other genes that are causing the immune system to misbehave. So we decided to use uh, RNA sequencing of immune cells to find both genetic mutations, inherited mutations, and mutations acqu acquired later in life that might cause immune cells to misbehave, causing the fatigue. So we focused on genes that could affect the immune cells that make autoantibodies. We also focused on mitochondrial mutations because there are a lot of them. And uh, this is also because, uh, as been explained, mitochondria are the energy source for all cells in the body, and they also influence autoimmune responses. There are actually several autoimmune diseases, and I pointed them out there, that appear to have a mitochondrial contribution. So what's the connection of mitochondria to, to uh, MECFS? Well, well, if I'm, not, I'm going to skip this part. This is a mitochondria. You already saw what it looked like <laughs> earlier today. And there was a lot of discussion there already about what could happen with these. So we have minimal findings so far. And I'm only going to tell you just a little bit of the data uh, from our data from 45 patients and, uh, that had CSF or FM and 31 controls. So what we found is that nearly all ME patients had mutations in mitochondrial genes that weren't seen in healthy controls. So this is different than Dr. McGregor's study. This is RNA-seq, so we're only looking at immune cells here. And we're only looking at cells that are expressed, that actually are, are doing something. So some of the patients had, had many potential fatigue-causing mutations, but, n but uh, not all the patients shared the same mutations in the same mitochondrial genes, which suggested that there are different subgroups in, in the um, uh, ME-CFS patients. So nearly all parts of the mitochondria have mutations in at least some of the, pa of the ME patients, indicating that the specific location of a mutation might not be important in causing ME. If we looked at the chromosomal genes, we found that so far no mutations were specific for, for ME in genes involved in autoimmunity. Uh, we didn't find any of those. Instead, we found uh, one mutation in several autoimmune disorders. So there, there seemed to be general for autoimmune disorders, not for ME. We found that this only 28 percent of the patients. Uh, these uh, gene mutations, we also found gene, gene mutations involved in steroid receptors, including estrogen, uh, uh, which were found in as many as 25 percent of the patients. 12 percent of, of the patients shared a significant mutation also in the heat shock gene, which many people have said might be important in, in uh, fatigue as well. This gene is required, as some of you know, as uh, uh, it, it's necessary for the proper production of a lot of different proteins. Okay, in summary, fatigue is a complex system involving cardiovascular, autonomic, and cognitive components. It's a complex disease that likely involves an autoimmune dysfunction in at least some of the patients along with possible 
mitochondrial contribution to the dysfunction. At least some cases of chronic fatigue syndrome uh, may be caused by a combination of mul multiple mutations in mitochondria and chromosomal genes. We now have samples from more than 280 and we'll soon have 340 patients with chronic fatigue sy syndrome but that we're actually comparing with those who have, who have ME and fibromyalgia as well as depression, migraine headache, and also healthy controls. And we're doing RNA-seq on all these to look at the mutations and gene expression as thoroughly as we can. This includes a number, we, in this we're including a number of families because it turns out that there is a familiar relationship in a lot of these, a lot of patients that we, uh, much more than we actually originally anticipated, uh, that uh, uh, may have other autoimmune diseases. We've seen that there's very often a patient who, who has chronic fatigue syndrome, there are many members of their family that also have different kinds of autoimmune diseases. So soon we'll know much more about chronic, uh, ME in diseases and we, uh, that, that overlap with, with ME, and we hope that this will uh, at least get us started in terms of trying to discover what is really causing and, as opposed, and also what is contributing to uh, disease. So thank you.